How's everybody doing this morning? Uh, we're going to start things off with, uh, to me, this is the ultimate answer back song. Uh, the song asks a question and it gives the answer. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I, I have this song, I, I have it as a rock anthem. I have it as a folksy song. I mean, this song could be done in so many different ways. Uh, we're going to do it the way hopefully everybody knows already. Nothing but the blood. If you can stand, let's stand. Stand. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the blood that makes me white as snow. But the blood of Jesus for my pardon, this I see. Nothing but the blood of Jesus for my cleansing, this I plead. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the blood. That makes me white as snow. No other fountain, no. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not a good that I have. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other bound I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the blood that makes me white as snow. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You can be seated. Good morning. Welcome into First Baptist Church. We're delighted to have uh, each and every one of you. We're going to have uh, three baptisms this morning. Um, Case and uh, Brendan will be getting baptized this morning. Uh, from He accepted Jesus at camp. And then we'll have uh, two of our girls from uh, VBS uh, this morning. So come on in, Case. Stand right there. Stand right there. Stand up. Stand up so they can see you. There you go. The church, can you say good morning, Kasten? Say good morning back. Yeah. Kasten's been on quite of a journey with his walk with Jesus. He accepted Jesus uh, about a year or so ago at uh, our last summer camp and had some snags in the road, but we got here today. And Kasten, uh, Kasten was my buddy, man, at camp. He was our helper, and uh, he wasn't going to let me fail. We were trying to figure out how to get to lunch, which is the most important thing at camp, because you've got to figure out lunch. And Kasten, uh, we were in line, and Kasten said, hey, Clint, there's another entrance to this, this dining facility. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, there's another entrance to this dining facility. I'm like, Kasten, everybody is standing in line, man. There's no 
other entrance to this dining facility. This dude knew that there was another entrance to that dining facility. <laughs> and he got us in quick, and we got to eat first, right? <laughs> so let's go ahead and have a seat. Okay, so what you're getting ready to do today will be the single best decision you ever make in your life, okay? I'm so thankful for you, so thankful for your walk, and uh, so thankful for your display of Jesus. Is it your public profession today that you're a Jesus follower? Say it loud. Let me... There you go. Well, then it is uh, my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in Christ and raised to walk in the newness of life. This next little girl right here, if you don't know Miss Katori, she's always got a smile on her face. It's cold, she says. Or come around this way. There you go. A little more sit right there. You okay? <laughs> Miss Katori uh, accepted Jesus at our VBS. We had an outstanding VBS this year. And uh, so thankful that we can uh, get to do VBS. And, uh, and it's so thankful to have these girls. Uh, Miss Katori, is it your public profession that you're a Jesus? <laughs> hey, let me finish. She said, yes. Amen. What well, is my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in Christ and raised to walk in the newness of life. I don't know if they're going to be able to see you, girl. Ooh, we keep missing. Whoa, Miss Kiona. Take your time. She's swimming for real. <laughs> huh? You okay? Is it cold? We're going to spin you around right here. Okay? Miss Keona also accepted Jesus at BBS. I'm so thankful for her and her walk in Jesus. Miss Keona, is it your public profession that you're a Jesus follower? Yes. Say it loud so they can hear you. Yes. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Ms. Kiona, it's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in Christ and raised to walk in the newness of life. Good morning. For those of you that don't know, my name is Nisa Walker and I'm an alternate on the Pastor Search Committee. And we take this time um, each Sunday to pray and ask God for our guidance for our church and our Pastor Search Committee. And those of you who have been praying for us, we appreciate it very much. And um, so let us pray. Dear God, we humbly bow before you this morning and we just praise your name, Lord, for these that have come to accept you as Lord and Savior. And Lord, we just pray a special prayer for them, Lord, that you just guide them and lead them. And Lord, just help us to be disciples, um, leaders, Lord, for these young ones. And we thank you for the people and all the men and women who are working with our children and our youth. We pray, Lord, that you will just be with them. And Lord, we pray for our church and uh, our pastor search committee, Lord, we pray that you just cleanse our hearts and our minds. And Lord, we pray in Christ's precious name that you just put a hedge about us. And Lord, just bind Satan in every way, Lord. We pray that you will just fill our hearts with your love and unity. And Heavenly Father, we especially pray for the pastor search committee as they wait and search and follow your direction and your timing, Lord. 
to find the man that you have out there waiting. Lord, we pray that you prepare his heart and mind as well. And we thank you for what you're going to do in these coming weeks and months and years, Lord, in this body of Christ. Lord, we thank you for your love, mercy, and grace. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. What a way to start off a Sunday morning, right? We uh, thank each and every one of you for being here at First Baptist. If you're visiting with us, if you would, look in the uh, chair in front of you. There should be a visitor's card there. If you could fill that out and put it in the offering, play as it, or offering uh, plate as it comes by you, uh, we'd appreciate that. We thank you uh, for, if you're tuning in on Facebook, we appreciate that. Um, and uh, I'm lost. Um, so tonight... Miss Barbara, are you ready for tonight? So tonight is game night, and Miss Barbara said don't even, she's so fired up. You guys, if you could see her face right now. She is so fired up. Game nights will be tonight from 5 to 7. Uh, we ask that you bring sandwiches, goodies, and games to share, and join us for a fun time and fellowship, and all ages are welcome. We look forward to that tonight. We are collecting crafts and activities for Operation Christmas Child. It'll be through the end of this month. If you have any crafts or activities, to be in the, uh, in the back, there's a tub that you can put those things in. Uh, the Baptist women will resume their meetings on Monday, September 11th. That'll be at 6 p.m. with a potluck dinner. And I asked you last week, and you told me I can't sneak in still. Man. You had me a potluck. So we ask that you uh, also mark your calendar for Sunday, September 24th. That'll be from 5 to 7 will be the uh, spaghetti fundraiser for Operation Christmas Child. As we've talked uh, about before, it costs about $10 a box to ship those things. Uh, and when we have about 150, that's about $1,500 for us to be able to ship those. And so it's really awesome to be able to, to give back. And uh, this fundraiser uh, helps us do that. Um, where's he at? Mr. Teddy Gaines here? There he is, Teddy Gaines, Deacon of the Week, ladies and gentlemen. There he is. Mr. Teddy Gaines will be the Deacon of the Week. So if you have anything that uh, arises, uh, take his number down, and uh, you guys can call Mr. Gaines, and uh, he'll, get, uh, he'll get you squared away. Do we have anything we may have missed this morning? All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for you this morning, and so thankful for you being here at First Baptist Church Hall, and then we're so thankful for your presence. We're so thankful for Mr. Burleson today, and we're so thankful that he is here, and we know that you uh, have your word in his heart, and uh, he is prepared to deliver it to us this week. Uh, we ask that you be with us as we go throughout the rest, of the rest of this worship service, that we do it in a manner that is pleasing unto you, and that you be with us throughout the rest of this week. Lead us and guide us and protect us, and that you nearly may we pray. Amen. Good morning. Today, um, the nominating committee wants to thank all the new members of our church committees who graciously and prayerfully agreed to step forward and serve here at First Baptist Holland. And we look forward to seeing how our church flourishes in the coming year um, under their guidance as they follow where God leads. So I'll go ahead and let you know um, the new members of each committee. They serve for three years. There are a couple of committees who have more than one new member where we had a vacancy to fill. So starting with trustees, we've added Brandon Spin. For benevolence, it's Olga Farley. Building and Grounds is Rick Barbosh. Children's Ministry, Amy Chenault. Counting is Joyce Hart. Finance, Clint is going to serve one more year. Thank you, Clint. And Riley Goff is going to be added. Historical is Linda Gaines. Hospitality is Diane Nichols. And Tammy Goff is also filling in for a, a vacancy. And for missions, um, we actually didn't have that one staffed, but it was in the bylaws, so we went ahead and staffed it fully this year. Fran Callahan, Kim Arnold, and Stephanie Churchwell. Nominating committee is Donna Bell. Nursery, Jean Bauerschlag. Personnel, Shemaine Spin. Student ministry, Megan White and Melody Hart. Worship committee, Rick Barbosh. 
And if you would like a copy of the membership committee list, you can find one out in the foyer. Thanks. All right, let's continue to sing this morning. We're going to sing, uh, Are You Washed in the Blood? Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Oh, are you washed in the blood, in the soul-praising blood of the Lamb? Are you garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily? The Savior's side, are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Oh, are you washed? Are you washed in the blood? In the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb. Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? When the bridegroom cometh, will your robe be white? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Will your soul be ready for the mansion flight? And be washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed? Are you washed in the blood? In the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white and snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin. And be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Don't be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed? Are you washed in the blood? In the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb. Are your garments spotless or the white as snow? Are you washed in the blood? All right, let's pray. We're going to take up our offering after this. And Lord, we just thank you for this time here this morning. Um, we're just thankful that we can come and worship you openly and freely, Lord. And may we always take advantage of that. And Lord, we lift up this time as we um, take up the offering that it would be used for your glory, that it would be used to further your kingdom. And we just thank you for your son, Jesus, who came and took our place, Lord, substituted himself for us and paid the price for our sin, Lord, and who makes the possibility of a relationship with you through him, Lord, and through a relationship with him. And um, we just thank you for that. And we just ask it all in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And we're gonna sing his name is wonderful. And then we're gonna go right into there's something about that name. <laughs> His name is wonderful, His name is wonderful, His name is wonderful, Jesus my Lord, He is a mighty King, Master of everything, His name Jesus 
the great shepherd, the rock of all ages, almighty God is He. Bow down before Him, love and adore Him, His name. Great to be back with you today, and praise God for those baptisms we just celebrated, right? Man. Thank you, Clint and Brandon, these guys who are uh, carrying the weight and it, allowing God to do his work through them. Keep loving on them. Thank you, gentlemen, for your work today. You know why we baptize, right? Um, a lot of reasons, three in particular. Number one because it's what we call a public profession of faith. It's, it's us declaring outwardly what God has done inwardly. When, when you see that act of baptism, it, it's what you read about in the book of Acts. Those early converts, there's this deep, instantaneous connection with God, and then an immediate response to, to back it up. It's believe, baptize, believe, baptize, believe, baptize. That's really the second reason that we baptize, because it demonstrates this change that's happened that we're acting upon. It's the idea that before baptism, we're standing there as our old, sick, sinful selves, and then we go under the water, and according to God's word, that sin is washed away. The, the scripture says it, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he or she is a new creation. 
The old is gone and the new has come. Just like we watch. And really that's the, the third reason we baptize, because Jesus was baptized. By the mode and means that, that you saw today. The, the Greek word for baptize is baptizo, and it, it means to immerse or submerge, to put down fully under the water. I giggled when she was hanging onto the glass, yes. There's nothing magical about that liquid back there. We don't sprinkle frou-frou dust in it. The supernatural is what happens when we in our hearts decide to take that step and allow God to move through us because we're recreating the very life and death and ministry of Jesus. You, you saw it. You just heard the Scripture. I say that when I baptize people. Romans 6, 4 the person standing there buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness with him. Here's his life and his death and his resurrection. And when we're baptized, that's what we're saying. We're saying, I let God do that in me. Have you? When I baptize folks, I often quote 1 John 2.6. It says, whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. That's pretty straight, isn't it? How do we do that? Well, it starts with baptism and continues from there. And I want us to talk about that for just a moment. How do we get from where we are to where God wants us to be? The roadmap for doing so actually comes from that very book you just heard, 1 John. So if you have a copy of God's Word, physical copy on your phone, whatever, I want you to find the book of 1 John, New Testament fifth book from the end, it goes James, first and second Peter, and then the book of first John. So a while back I was, um, I was taking my son to a party at a friend's house, and no sooner had we hopped in the truck than he blurted out to me, but dad, do you even know how to get there? And I said, no, but this does, and I held up the map app on my phone. Right? We're living in a different day and time, but it's true. All I had to do was punch in my, my desired address, and it guided me right to it if I follow it. Some of you, you ever been driving, and you go, this is quicker than what that's showing me, and you go up this way, and the map starts going crazy, or if you have it unmuted, she starts talking to you. Turn around in 100 yards. Go this way. Go that way, and it gets all confused. Friends, the same is true spiritually. We may not know how to get there. You, today, you may not know how to get from where you are to where God wants you to be. But I promise you, this knows. It knows how to get you there. And all you have to do is, is punch in where you want to go. Whether that is, is peace or joy or strength, or forgiveness, or heaven. And then just follow it. And it'll get you to where you want to be. That's why the Apostle John, what he says in these little letters is so important. Last time when I was with you, we talked about the fact that John wrote that first gospel, the one you find with Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He wrote that one in the hopes that people would just come to believe in Jesus. That's why it's written the way it is. And, and he opens up talking about that. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We've seen it. That was so people would just come to know the Christ that He had come to know. But then he turns around and he writes this little set of letters. And, and this is not just about people believing in Jesus. What do we say? It's about them showing Jesus. Not just knowing God's Word, which a lot of us do, but, but knowing what to do with God's Word once you got it. In other words, in the first letter that John wrote, that's the what. The first chapter in this one. But in what we're about to read today, 1 John chapter 2, his attention is on the how. Look at it. 1 John chapter 2, beginning in verse 12. Here's what he says. He says, I'm writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven 
on account of His name. Right? It's where we all start. In sin, the word is hamartia. It, it, it means missing the mark. It, it's the picture of, of a person pulling back a bow and arrow and taking a shot, but never hitting the target. Missing it. That's what the word for sin means. God set up the target. His Son, He's perfect. None of us aren't. If you don't know if you're perfect or not, ask somebody who lives with you. They'll tell you. The Bible declares it. Romans 3.23 All sin fall short of the glory of God. All of us miss the mark. And yet John tells us here that, that our sin, all of our missing the mark can be what? Forgiven. I don't know if you know this or not, the, the Bible word for forgive, and, and I like stepping into these sometimes because it really opens it up and helps us understand. The Bible word for forgive comes from two little Greek words, apo and hemi. And you put them together because each of them means to send away. Apohemi. In, in other words, when God forgives you, He takes whatever it is, whatever sin or sins, and when He forgives you, He sends them away so that you and I are free to move on with life. He, he lets us go from whatever it is. We have a hard time doing that with people, don't we? Somebody offends you. Somebody speaks ill of you. Somebody says something, wait, to your family. That's hard to send away, isn't it? But that's what the Scripture says here. He starts with where we all start, and then he addresses us where we all are. Verse 13, he says, I write to you, fathers and mothers, because you've known him who's from the beginning. In other words, you're, you're supposed to be more mature in your faith. I write to you, young people, because you've overcome the evil one. He's talking about people who are younger in faith. God got to you early. He helped you be victorious, like you just saw this morning. Their little foundations are getting poured before a lot of other people who come to know Christ. I write to you, dear children, because you know the Father. You're hearing about Him. You're being taught how to have a relationship with Him, whether it's at camp or VBS or some other church event. I write to you, fathers and mothers, because you have known Him who's from the beginning. You're not rookies anymore. You're supposed to be veterans of life and, and faith, and you've been through some battles, and like a pastor friend of mine says, you've got some skins on the wall and some scars to show for it. I write to you, young people, because you're strong, and the Word of God lives in you, and you've overcome the evil one. The word strong, it actually has some oomph to it. It doesn't just mean hmm, strong, it means mightier, stronger. In other words, you, you find something you think has power and strength in it, and, and what the Word of God says is that He is stronger. He is greater. All of us are at one of those different stages that John talks about here. And then look at verse 15, he says, Do not love the world. All of our mission is the same, regardless of our age. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If you love the world... Love for the Father is not in you. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful people, the lust of their eyes, and their boasting about what they have and do comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will, oh boy, there's that word, the stumbling block for us, the will of God. I have people all the time, you do too, Man, how do I know what God's will is, they'll say. Or if I only knew God's will, or if I only knew what God wanted from me. The little word is thalimi, and you know what it means? Determination, choice. Whoever does the determination or choice of God lives forever. Good pastor friend of mine, he says it this way. He says, what's God's will for you? To do the next right thing. What's God's will for your life? To do the next right thing. Trust Him. Serve Him. Ask Him. Follow Him. Honor Him. Share Him. Paul says in Philippians 4.8, whatever is true or right or noble or pure or lovely or admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, put that into practice. 
What's God's will for my life? That. Romans 12, 2 says, Stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you. Instead, fix your attention on God and what He wants. And then you'll learn God's will, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So here we go. I've tried to simplify this for us. How do I get from where I am to where God wants me to be? First of all, I've got to know my age in faith. Not in life. When, when John talks about children and young people and he's calling us out, he's not just talking about our physical age, because here's why. Our date age has nothing to do with our faith age. You know that? Because there are people who make a profession of faith, and yet decades later, they aren't any further along than when they started. Is that you? You came to know Christ when you were six, seven, eight years old, but now you're an adult by age, and yet still that age spiritually. I hope that's not you, but, but you know what? The devil hopes it is you. Because if so, he's got you right where he wants you. Cold, indifferent, and not growing. Do not love the world, said verse 15. You know why? Hear me. Because your affection will change your connection to God. And to other people. Has it changed yours? God spoke to the people after he brought them out of Egypt in the Old Testament. Here's what he said, Deuteronomy 6.12. Be careful, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt and out of the land of slavery. Have you forgotten? You know, we're in the midst of something, we pray, God, get me out of this. And he says, okay. God, if you help me through this, if you help my loved one, if you do this or that, <clears throat> God, I'll do anything. We pray it, he does it, and then time passes, and all of a sudden, what happens? We forget. We forget how oppressed we were. We fail to remember all that God got us through. We become ungrateful for how good we got it now when yesterday we were miserable. We start ignoring what it means to be a slave to sin. We just call it a bad habit. We begin neglecting our relationship with the one who unlocked the gate and let us out. Is that you? Then perhaps it's time to, to own up and get things going again in your life. Restart that quiet time in the morning. You're already a person of faith, you know that. Or get back into church. Or find a small group and be a part of it. Or seek out a ministry and, and serve do something in your life that's just not about you, but it's about other people. Anything you can do to grow yourself in faith. Second way we get to, from where we are to where God wants us to be. Here's the second one. We also got to be aware of our stage in life. The other one is our age, our maturity point in faith. I'm talking to you about your stage of life. Great writer Richard Needham, he put it in a playful way. He said this, there's seven different stages of life. I love this. Spills, thrills, drills, bills, ills, pills, and wills. That's pretty funny, isn't it? <laughs> Life, right there. Seven stages. But he's right, isn't it? The, the point being, what's going on in your life at present may look nothing like what's going on in that other person's life at present, but both of them are important because God's at work in both. You know, we get older and we forget we were the same way they were when we were little, or worse, like my mom says. We forget. We get amnesia about what we were like and what we did. 
and the trouble we caused. Are you aware of that? Friend, do you realize that God may be trying to strengthen their faith even though they're young, except if you keep butting in every time they face a challenge, then they'll never have an opportunity to grow through it. Muscles don't grow by decreasing the weight, remember? There's got to be that tension. Do you realize that God may be trying to teach you dependence during that trial? Because all of a sudden you, you got pretty self-sufficient and you begin kind of going off on your own where at one time you were asking the Lord about everything. All of a sudden you got your sea legs under you, so to speak, and, and that began to stop. But if you bail on your beliefs or you focus on whatever the challenge is or on your own abilities, you will never reap the promise of God's presence and what He can do in your life. Why? Because it's all about you. You're not giving Him room to work. Jesus didn't promise us a pain-free life. He just said we could have peace in the middle of it, remember? That's why John called out the stage of all these people that he knew, apparently he had seen. He was talking to specifics, right? I'm sure as he wrote these, he had specific individuals, I think, in mind, believers that he knew. Folks struggling just to get past the fact that, that they were actually forgiven. Is that you? You have a hard time buying into what I just said a while ago, that, that God can actually send away your sin when you confess it to him? And you carry guilt so great that you feel paralyzed. Or a fear that's so strong that, that you feel immobilized. There's a great word in Romans 8.1. It says, therefore now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. When you come to God and you confess your sin, you say, God, I, I blew this one. I messed this up. And He forgives you. There is no condemnation from God over you anymore. Even if other people still condemn you or sneer at you or scoff at you or look down at you, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Psalm 32.5 says, Acknowledge your sin. Don't cover up your iniquity. Confess your transgressions to the Lord and He will forgive not just the sin but the guilt of your sin as well. John called out those people who've known God. We read it. Perhaps should have known better. Is that you? God has cared for you so long. Why would he stop caring now? That's how we relate to one another. He doesn't relate to us that way. He calls out people who are strong and overcome. They were strong, and at one point they did achieved a victory in their life, but all of a sudden they didn't feel like it anymore. And so John spoke specifically to them. People who once led but had since fled. <laughs> they used to be able to pray down heaven, but, but now they, something happened and, and they'd given up on just about everything on earth. Is that you or somebody you know? Galatians chapter 2, Paul speaking. He says, what happened to you? After beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? Have you suffered much for nothing? Does God give you His Spirit and work miracles among you for nothing? If righteousness could be gained through rule-keeping or the law, Christ died for nothing. Have you started thinking that way? You know what? This, this whole church thing, this, this whole religion thing, it's not worth it. It, it's not producing things in my life. That, that's a worldly attitude. That's why John said what he did in verse 15. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You know why? Because we can't serve two masters. We can't think like God on one hand. We think we can. And then think like we want on the other hand. It, it's got to be a merge of our mindsets until his takes over. It's his final way we get from where we are to where God wants us to be. You ready? 
The third one is we've got to pay attention to our gauge or gauges. What do I mean by that? How many of you have been driving down the road and all of a sudden you've seen a light on your dashboard pop on? Seen that happen, right? Just fire up the vehicle. And how many of you, after seeing the light on the dashboard pop on in your vehicle, do you just keep driving? And how many of you right now, if I went out and I cranked your vehicle, it would look like Christmas lights on your dashboard? It's telling you your tire's low and your oil's low and you've got to do this and that and that, but you just keep on driving. I'm going to get to it one day until one day somewhere between here and there you're on the side of the road because guess what? You weren't listening. The gauge told you the indicator light specifically. I mean, our cars are smart now. Used to we had to go to the book and figure out what the light meant. Now it tells us exactly what's wrong. If you've got, if you've got a new vehicle, the same is true spiritually. That's why John warned against the cravings of sinful man, the lust of our eyes, the desires we find in the world. Which, by the way, he lists all that stuff, you know, those last verses we read. Cravings and lust and desires, it's all the same word in the Greek language. In other words, don't start thinking that their sin is worse than your sin. Or what they're doing is, is a lot worse than, than anything you would ever do. Because God doesn't see it that way. He doesn't see sin. He sees sin. And those, those warning lights as a believer, those indicators tell us that we're about to have a real problem if, if we don't do anything about it. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 24 says, but they did not listen or pay attention. Instead, they followed the stubborn inclinations of their evil hearts. They went backward and not forward. Is that you? I learned a great little checklist years ago. It's not my own, but I want to pass it on to you. It's a little diagnostic, if you will, where you can sit down and evaluate some checkpoints, some indicators in your life, and it, it gives it to you in a way that I hope you won't forget. It's called HALT. And it asks you to, to look at yourself and ask, am I hungry? Am I angry? Am I lonely? Am I tired? You know why? Because those four things will flip our apple cart. Think about it. When you're hungry, you're, when you're angry, when you're lonely, when you're tired, you tend to make foolish decisions. That's not all the indicators, but, but friends, if we could get a hold of those four and get those regulated and know when one of those things happens... It's time for us to, to stop, to halt, and do something about it. Or maybe you get home, and, and you're all of these. Or you get home, and you're, you're hungry, and you're tired. That's not the time to have the conversation about the life dream that you want to do. Husband, wife, when your spouse comes in, that's not the time to have that conversation. They're tired. You're not going to hear the right thing. They're not going to be able to think the right thing. When you're angry at someone, that's not the time to go out and try to win someone else to Jesus. In fact, he said, if you or your brother have a sin against you, leave your offering at the altar and then go fix that and then come back and we'll talk. Take this to heart. Take these key indicators. Put them into practice. Learn what happens to you when you're in these particular phases. <laughs> and it'll help you regulate your life. Those gauges are telling us something about ourselves. Triggers, they're often called, right? Knowing what causes you to stumble. Knowing what starts the process of your fall. Knowing that there are going to be times when you need a break. Otherwise, you're going to lash out and say something that you really didn't mean to say, or do something that the normal with it you wouldn't have done. Some of you need to do that today in the quietness of your heart. Maybe to have a conversation with God. Maybe to confess something. 
Maybe to ask for his forgiveness. Maybe to ask for their forgiveness. Or ask the Lord for strength or or joy or or purpose or, or peace, whatever it is. I want to give you a moment to do that right now as we close out our time together. And so I'm going to ask you just in the quietness of your heart just to bow your head where you are. And I want to pray for you and then give you an opportunity to spend just a moment with the Lord. Father, today we're before you with many needs on our hearts and our minds. Lord, there are some here who need to consider their age and faith and and recognize where they are or they should be spiritually. And to take steps to get back to where you want them to be, I, I pray you'll help them to take those steps and to find that way. Lord, there's some here who need to be aware of their stage in life and and know that even though things may have changed or be changing, that your expectation for them has not. Help them as they continue to trust you or or restart again or, or go forward. And Lord, I have no doubt there are some here who need to pay attention to those gauges. Those indicator lights that are flashing and telling them that something's not right. God, lead them to confession. A reconciliation. Or away from temptation. Or whatever it is, I pray. In Jesus' name. As we stay in this moment of prayer just for a little bit longer, it may be that you're here today or maybe you're watching online and deep down in your heart you know that the next right thing for you to do is to surrender your heart and life over to the Lord. And maybe the answer for you is is something larger than simply me praying for you. It's in fact you praying to Him and asking the Lord for the very first time to exert His power in your life to give him your heart and and surrender control the decision making process of who you are over to him you need God's peace and you're ready to receive it you need him to be God and, and you're ready to follow him you want things to be right and you're ready to take the steps to make it so if that's you then I'm going to ask you to do something bold and and this is just between you and the Lord And so I can pray with you in this moment. If if you know in your heart of hearts that you never come to that point, maybe you've even been in church, then on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to just slip your hand up for just a moment. Slip it up.